Well, good morning. I'm Pastor Amanda, and I'm grateful that we can be here in this place together as God's people this morning. I do also want to welcome our online worshipers at whatever time and in whatever place you are able to settle in with us and with the Spirit of God. I am so grateful that you have chosen to do so. There are any number of factors. I know that those of us in the room were looking around and thinking it is easy to social distance this morning. <laughs> Uh, there's adequate space for that, and that is good. Folks, we have staff who are COVID positive and still quarantining, uh, and so thank you to our musicians who are pinch hitting this week as Mary Beth finishes uh, her time at home. Uh, we've got folks who are non-COVID sick on staff as well as others, I'm sure, and so that's why we can't offer our kid life in nursery today. So just thank you to everybody for your understanding as life just kind of is what it is right now. and. We'll We'll covet all your prayers. I've really, I've got some time of prayer planned, of course, later in the service. I do want to make sure you're aware of just a couple of things on the announcements. Those of you in the room have the worship sheet, but those of you online, I really want to make sure you're aware of this as well. I guess maybe the one big thing, I want to make you aware that I am going to lead a book study and that will start on Wednesday, January 26th at 10 a.m., and that'll be on for five Wednesdays. The book is by Kate Bowler, and the title is Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved. She helps us think through the stuff that we can kind of hear in tough times that aren't really the truth. And she's just a beautiful storyteller. It's a delightful book to read. Even if you don't want to come to the study, I commend that book really highly. And for now, I had planned just the in-person study. Folks, if you are interested in a Zoom on an evening or at an alternate time, please give me some feedback on that. Uh, my email address, Pastor Amanda at DecaturFirstUMC.org, or give me a call if you've got my phone number, that kind of thing. If there is desire for a, a Zoom version, I'll be happy to add that where I can. And there is a sign-up sheet out here, or you can let the office know if you are going to participate and if you would like us to get you a book. But that we'd really like to know if you want the book by mid midweek this week. So that's the big thing uh, that I wanted to make you aware of. And with that, let us just get our hearts and minds ready to be fully in the presence of God. when you hear those low notes on the organ, does it just feel like the Spirit of God reverberating through you? I just love that. Um, so in case we have kiddos worshiping online, I don't want to skip over our children's message or anything, so I'm going to be uh, the pastor mom and say, Mason and Parker, would you come up and be my partners in crime here? Please.
been a long time since you guys have come and been up here for a children or with me for a children's because I love you <laughs> and you love me maybe not as much right now <laughs> so y'all are familiar even you you know you fully grown children of God that I had this box that was just plain white all through Advent and so our new staff member Bree I asked her if she'd make it fun and she absolutely did so now I have a really cool box to to bring our children's message together and so I want to start by reading a word of scripture it says when all the people were being baptized Jesus was baptized too and as he was praying heaven was opened the Holy Spirit came to rest on him in the form of a dove a voice came from heaven it said you are my son and I love you I am very pleased with you now I'm curious and I think you two will have just lovely answers and if there are kids watching at home you can answer these questions in, at home how do you know when someone loves you when they, when they make you do this when they bring you to church and make you sit in front of everybody Mm hmm that's super specific how about any other ways do you know when people love you when they say I love you yep perfect example I'll open it up to the crowd how do you know when people love you when someone loves you they give a hug. When, they help you. when they help yes when they help that's an, a, a sign of love Did I, when they hug you hug you yes Another, a sign of affection is a sign of love. They smile at you. Smile, yes, absolutely. When they pray for you. When they pray for you, yes. So many ways that we can show love. It can be saying the words out loud. It can be actions that are helping, that are affectionate, all those kinds of things, whether near or far. And so there are lots of ways that we can know that someone loves us. So today's scripture involved both the speaking of love and the showing of love by action because of course God's voice came from the heavens and said I love you he was just so happy when Jesus was baptized but it was also that descending of the dove that physical presence of God too and so for the next number of weeks the children's message series is going to kind of lean in toward Valentine's Day and we're going to be looking at some different conversation hearts and so looking at these different hearts you lovely children of God up here, do you see any of these that maybe look like what we just talked about today? Oh, Mason found it. It's love you. <laughs> well, I couldn't show it. I only have so many hands. I have my own heckler when I have Parker up here with me. <laughs> but yes, so our first conversation heart for the series is love you and after this Sunday I'm going to start finding a place to display these so and when we pray at the close of our children's message during this series instead of normal prayer hands we're gonna do heart prayer hands so you guys pray with me do heart prayer hands thank you all for participating out there too let's do heart prayer hands God we know that you love us in so many different ways and for us one of the ways we know that is that you sent Jesus so continue to pour out your love for each of us and help us to let that love move right through our lives to others. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you, guys. I know that was super awkward for you, but I am appreciative. <laughs> Would you please stand as able for the call to worship? The Father's voice bears witness to the Son. God has shown himself to us. The Son bows his head beneath the waters of the Jordan. God has shown himself to us. Christ submits to John's baptism and frees us from slavery. God has shown himself to us. God's love is seen to the end of the world. Our opening hymn is the 
Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Let us be in an attitude of prayer. O God of all creation, you came into the world that we might know love and new life. Pour your spirit on your church that it may fulfill Christ's command to live the gospel everywhere, that the proclamation of the good news might be heard throughout the earth. Reassure us that we are your beloved people. Defend us against all evil and temptation. Give us grace to bear faithful witness to you. Endue us with love. Keep us constant in prayer. Empower us for the service of love. Amen.
As we continue on in that beautiful spirit of God which is among us, I just remind us of our gifts and tithes and offerings. I know we're giving those in uh, tangibly, various ways, online, as you go in and out of service, of course, there's an offering opportunity or sending it in the mail, all those ways that you give. Thank you so much. We ended 2021 so much stronger than we thought we might, and that is due to your generosity. Not just those of you in the room, I know those of you who have been online for a lot of months, you've continued to be financially faithful, and that is meaningful. That is a faithfulness and a trust of God, and that is entrusting those gifts to the church to do ministry. So much thanks. And I would just like to offer a word of blessing over what we give. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for that which we manage in this life, enough to delight in our own lives and to be generous toward others. Continue to grow within us a, a heart like yours so that we can be wise in all that we do including how we use our money, our time, our talent, our training, all of those things. We just want to bring you glory here and in every place we live our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.
may be seated. As we come into this time of prayer, um, I got to thinking this week about weights. And I read somewhere, I don't know if it was like a little blurb on Facebook or whatever it was, you know that sometimes we can accumulate these little things and we carry them and we do okay, but even with my, my dinky little two pound weights, if I try to just stand here with my dinky little two pound weights for a very long time, which I already worked out this morning, so I'm going to put my arms down, I, my arms would fatigue, right? Even on something that looks like Barbie's weights or something. <laughs> Nothing very substantial, but all those little things, and some things are bigger, of course, they add up and they can fatigue in a way that we maybe don't always even recognize. And so today as we have this time of prayer, I'm going to put my weights just up here on the altar as a little bit of a symbol. I want to remind us that sometimes we need a time and a place, not to quit, but to rest. One of my favorite um, workout instructors, that's what she says all the time. She says, it's okay to rest, just don't quit, you know? And so as we have this moment of prayer this morning, quite frankly, especially since y'all online can take as so much time as you want, I'm, I want to open up officially. The altar is never closed, by the way, church. The altar of God here is never closed. If you want to come up and pray, if you need to come up and pray during a sermon, you know, the altar is not closed to any of you. But I want to intentionally... Um, as I did last week, just leave a few moments it, for us in worship that if you would like to come and just, you know, kind of like I've put some of my weights here on the altar, if you need to leave something with God to let it rest for a minute. I mean, you may have to go back to it Monday. You may have to deal with it, you know, this afternoon, whatever the thing. I keep looking up in the balcony and there's like, <laughs> you're right there. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to give us that space. I know for me, I was reflecting because I'm going to take a time, a moment at the altar. This time last year, we were online only still for worship. I think that was true here as well at this time. Um, I know for me, my grandmother died last January, and that memory is coming right back around. And so I was feeling um, a little bit of that weight. So maybe I'm doing this for me, but I hope that it is a spiritual truth and a, and a moment for all of you as well. Um, so the altar is open. I will still offer a pastoral prayer uh, briefly in a few moments, and we will have our Lord's Prayer. But if anybody wants to come up here and join me, feel free. Let us pray. 
There really is a balm in Gilead. Lord, you are a balm to our souls. You constantly beckon us to come to you. Come and rest and learn from you, for your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And so, Lord, when we need to, may we completely set down that which weighs us down, just to take a break, to rest in your strength, and to rest in your love, the wholeness and completeness of your love for us. And now, in wholeness as the body of Christ, we pray together in the way that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for allowing me to also kind of be a person needing to connect with God in your midst as I am also actively your pastor. And as we continue on worshiping, let us sing this beautiful hymn, Sweet, Sweet Spirit, number 334. Stand, if you will. Our scripture lesson today is Luke chapter 3, verses 15 to 17, and 21 and 22. The people were filled with expectation, and everyone wondered whether John might be the Christ. John replied to them all, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than me is coming. I'm not worthy to loosen the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The shovel he uses to sift the wheat from the husks is in his hands. He will clean out his threshing area and bring the wheat into his barn, but he will burn the husks with a fire that can't be put out. When everyone was being baptized, Jesus also was baptized. While he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit came down on him in bodily form like a dove. And there was a voice from heaven. You are my son, whom I dearly love in you. I find happiness. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So in your imagination, would you join me a little bit in entering into this moment, this text, this story? Imagine the people who are gathered around, they're listening to John's message, they don't have pews, you know, they're just down by the river, right? They've come with these expectations. You know, there's the murmur around, is he the Christ? expecting something. I mean, these are God-sized expectations. These are save us, will you, expectations. Isn't there more to life than this kind of expectations? And I can imagine being among them and feeling a little bit of the energy they might have been feeling because expectation, it can show through our bodies even without ever saying a word, right? You can tell if a crowd is bored. Now it's harder with your masks on. <laughs> or you can tell if a crowd is engaged. 
you know? Because like if there is this anticipation and this excitement and expectation, usually bodies have this little bit of a collective lean in, you know, maybe you turn your good ear toward the speaker, or maybe there is just this extra concentration, or maybe there's that little whisper of, you know, friend to friend, oh, did you hear what he said? Because they did not have microphones. Um, and so they were in this expectation mood, and so I suspect there's like this energetic thing in the air, kind of like the static in our dry winter air that just kind of moves among the people. And so what were they expecting? And Luke doesn't tell us all these details for sure, but John had some momentum going in his ministry of preparing the way of the Lord. So I suspect that their expectation that kept them coming to John's baptism in the water had something to do. It was in the arena or general vicinity of hope and forgiveness and restoration and blessing. I think that's what people of any age, any generation would show up for and keep on showing up for. And sure enough, John speaks his message about life different than this, whatever their this was, and arguably better. Better than potential lives in shame and turmoil and never enough. And I know I'm making assumptions here, but you know, the, the text doesn't tell us all these details. And John has this invitation to baptism that cleanses from sin, that cleanses from stuff that weighs us down, and offers a renewed readiness for encountering, in John's message, the one who is yet to come. There's no get-rich-quick scheme, and there's no promise about health or success or power in John's message. But there is this word about someone coming who can sift the wheat from the husks, Someone who is ready and able to work at helping folks who are willing to separate the fruit from the fluff, the grain that is useful from the extra stuff that no longer serves its purpose, and move on into a new and fruitful life. This sifting, of course, is a natural part of the growth cycle of a crop. Now, I did not ever, I'm a corn and soybean kind of gal, and I didn't know uh, much about wheat, and so I went on the YouTube and found a neat little video of a modern family uh, doing some of this by hand, and they were beating the wheat in a bag, and then they used a box fan. You know, they were dumping the wheat into um, a five-gallon bucket, and the chaff, that extra stuff, it just blew away. And I thought that was just such a cool video, but because of copyrights and this and that, I didn't bring it for us today. But you can go on YouTube and look up, you know, separating the wheat from the chaff and, and see something if you're interested. But I thought that's the point, isn't it? The sifting, this is not a scripture about judgment. The sifting, this separation of the grain from the husk is a preparation for what is next. It is clarifying and refining action before moving on to the next phase. That chaff, that extra stuff that used to protect the growing grain, is simply no longer needed. It's burned up not because it's bad, but because it is no longer necessary and isn't going to do any good in the next steps that take the grain toward its next preparation toward nourishment. And so when John uses this image, it is an everyday image of a grain farmer using a very normal tool of the trade to extract the fruit, which is the goal of all that growing labor. When we think of this sifting for our own lives, I think we do well to remember that the sifting will change things, certainly, but that the goal is to gather the grain, to gather in the good stuff that has grown in the most recent season of our lives, and to let maybe the wind of the Spirit blow away the chaff the stuff that is no longer serving us, no longer protecting what had been growing. What doesn't serve not just us, but maybe also what doesn't serve God or doesn't serve our neighbor. And please notice with me that John did not promise that Jesus was coming to fulfill the people's every desire or to meet their every single need. The image that Luke provides from John's message to the crowds is this very specific image of separating the useful and nutritionally valuable from the extra, the useless, the kindling. And it says Jesus will take care of getting rid of that extra totally and completely. And so John tells the people who had gathered with expectations that Jesus is coming to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with that fire 
that Jesus will come ready at that time without delay to separate within them what is fruitful from what is fluff and burn away that fluffy stuff, the stuff that's no longer needed when the good stuff goes on to nourish and to do good. See, we're all in process all the time. You know, just like we, we plant crops every year in season and then there's that season of harvest and we do it all over again next spring, right? And that's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit does. It comes to change us. The Spirit enters into our hearts and lives to help us learn and grow and mature. I want to share a few verses from Titus. Chapter 2, verses 11 through 14 point toward this reality as well. It says, The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. Now, we just spent all of Advent and Christmas proclaiming that, right? It educates us so that we can live sensible, ethical, and godly lives right now. Right now. That to me is a big deal. It's not just saved for eternity. That salvation thing is not just connected with then, but with now. Right now. By rejecting ungodly lives and the desires of this world. At the same time, we wait for the blessed hope and the glorious appearance of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, because of course we're in that already and not yet. We're waiting for that coming again. He gave himself for us in order to rescue us from every kind of lawless behavior and cleanse a special people for himself who are eager to do good actions. Are we an eager people? Are you eager to do the good stuff? I love that image. I am eager to do the good stuff. There's a lot of stuff, friends, that I am not eager to do. I am not eager to do my taxes. I will do them, but not with eagerness. There are a lot of things that we do, but you know, it's not the exciting stuff, right? But, but we are baptized, we are transformed, we are cleansed, we get rid of the fluff so that we can be left with the good stuff and have an eagerness to do that which is love, to smile and express warmth to others, to live in relationship. And so John offered a baptism of repentance on that riverside so that a person could be readied for the transformation and for what comes next. That baptism of repentance cleanses and refreshes and helps a person be ready for the next step, the next level, the next lesson, the next phase of growth, and the Holy Spirit then stays with us always. Now in theological terms, for those of you who kind of like to have the church language that we use tied to such things, the acceptance of grace and the cleansing of baptism of repentance, of course, is our justification with God. That time that we are accepted by God and and we are saved. And then the life we live in the Spirit, in the ongoing growth and maturing that comes from the baptism of the Spirit, is the sanctification or the going on to perfection in love in this life that our founder, John Wesley, believed was possible. I always find that to be one of our unique Wesleyan uh, bits of theology, that we are going on toward perfection in love in this life. He believed that was achievable, that there was enough possibility in the Holy Spirit that we could be perfected in love. And I think that is an excellent goal for all of our lives. In fact, when I was ordained, I have to answer that question. Are you going on to perfection? Yes, I am. And so this is what is before us. This is what John was out there preaching. And I think it's also what can help us make sense of then why Jesus chose to engage in this water baptism alongside all the other folks being baptized. It wasn't a question of forgiveness. It was for readiness. Jesus' baptism and the descending of the Spirit as a dove and the voice of God, it was a gateway and a preparation for what would come next. Jesus definitely continued to grow and learn and love and live in a very next level kind of way as he entered into his public ministry after his baptism. And of course it wasn't that Jesus went from bad to good and made some kind of 180 degree shift in his life, but it was still an important movement and a gateway for Mary and Joseph's son to transition into the public life to being son of God and son of man and really owning that. It's a big shift in how Jesus would understand himself in relationship to the world, as well as an external revealing of the presence of God's Son in the flesh. He really lived in a different mode in his public ministry. And that might make us think about our baptisms as well. Our baptisms may or may not be a 180 degree shift situation. It depends on what our former life was. 
If you were raised in the church and or influenced by godly people and lived a life that was already based on loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself, then the cleansing water of baptism for sure washes away every sin. But that doesn't mean every single person has to make a total 180 degree turn. We just need to level up, grow in grace and maturity and into the likeness of Christ Jesus our Lord. And so our baptisms are a gateway into our own next steps. It's never just get baptized, check. Baptism is a very public movement from what has been into what is yet to be, very specifically with the chosen presence of God in our lives. And so like the people who came to hear John speak with expectations, I'm quite sure we all come to church, to scripture, to prayer, to God with expectations. Sometimes we'll be delighted at what we hear and take the plunge. Sometimes we'll be disappointed with the truth that there is a God who loves and who will never abandon or forsake us, but who is not going to wave a magic wand and grant our every wish. Remember, there were folks who listened to Jesus' message in the day and turned away because they were like, hmm, I'm not quite all in. But for those who take the plunge, those who say yes, those who say, I want the relationship, I want the renewal, the growth, and the maturity that God is offering to me, there is a beautiful, bountiful life of grace and mercy and love in store every time. Not a life without troubles, but a life well-lived and well-connected to God and each other. That's the other kind of great thing about understanding this sifting offered in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We are not just saved and set aside or something so boring as that. We are sifted strengthened, made more mature, not just for ourselves, but in community and for community. And just as God above was so pleased and delighted in Jesus at the time of his baptism, I believe that even if God's voice doesn't boom over each of our baptisms or each of our next steps of faith, I'm convinced that God is well pleased each time his beloved choose to engage in the process of maturing and becoming the person they are going to be next. And so now, just, I invite you as we sing our, our final hymn, it's three verses of Down to the River to Pray. I, since I had you come forward to pray already and we anointed last week, I didn't put water in the font, but I do invite you to think on your baptism or any reaffirmations of that, if it was confirmation for you or whatever uh, the case may be, do think on your baptism and what leveling up might look like at this stage of your life. Let us pray. Lord God, life with you is an adventure. So Lord, I pray that whatever might need to blow away, you may do so with the wind of your Holy Spirit and that what this last phase of life has been for us, the fruit that has been growing, if it's ready to be harvested, Lord, I pray that you bring it forward so that what is next, we can be eager people ready to do good and lean into becoming perfect in love. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand as you are able and join me in Down to the River to Pray.
Well, church, I hope that you come to worship with expectations. And I hope that in meeting God here and with each other, those expectations are met. And I hope that we all go out into the world eager to do good. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, God's people said,